What is your name? Sarah Seeger. And what do you do? Professor of astro... Let's see. What do I do? I work on exoplanets and the search for life beyond Earth. All right. And are we alone? Well, that is not a very scientific question to start with. Why is that? <laughs> because we really have no idea. We really don't know at all. But we do... You know, wait, wait. Just because oh. we don't know doesn't mean it's not scientific. No. It's because the biologists don't like that. Well, I'll just... Okay. The biologists hate it when astronomers say, yes, I believe there is definitely life out there. Yes. As an astronomer, and thinking about the math and the numbers and the hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy and the hundreds of billions of galaxies out there, I'm convinced there must be life somewhere. You know, everywhere. Oh, but wait, we, yeah. but that argument, I, that's the, but 90% of astronomers, 80% of astronomers Right, and the that. biologists hate that argument. Well, they hate it because you're talking about, you're multiplying one number, it's a big number, times a number you don't know, and then saying it's large. Exactly, so, exactly. So, let's, we, well, you don't do that then. I do have a little more thought behind it, but it's not as scientific or quantitative as we'd like. What we do know for sure now is that there are exoplanets, planets orbiting stars other than the sun. We know that rocky planets, based on their mass and size and average density, are very common. And we know that planets, all kinds of planets, appear to be in their star's habitable zone. We also know that wherever we look, the ingredients for life, at least, the very basic building blocks, are common. They want to form. When we look and we see organics in the interstellar medium, you know, we look on planets in our own solar system, and although they don't have life as we know it yet, we do see the building blocks for life. And so we put all that together. And I'm sure even though it will not satisfy the biologists, it just gives us more hope that there is life out there somewhere. At least there's a home for life. There's chance for life to so arise. So the ingredients are there, but maybe not the recipe. <laughs> yeah, well, that just depends, actually. I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Uh, well, this is your interview. So, but I did want to mention, I, I was wondering whether the presence of liquid water on a planet could be seen as a biosignature. Because, I mean, Lynn Margulis, before she died, wrote an article about life on Earth may play a very important role in keeping liquid at the surface. And, I'm, and the more I look at planets, I say, wow, that, that water is so easy to get rid of. And, and I'm wondering if the idea that when you have a planet with liquid water on it might be a biosignature. I've never heard of oh, that. I see. Yeah. No, I disagree with the thought that water itself might be a biosignature. Liquid water in the surface. Liquid water might why, be. Why because would that? when we see life on Earth, it uses water. It's not creating water. And so maybe it's main, the, her no, argument was that it's that. maintaining it. The thing is, what I do think, at least on Earth, is we're lucky we have our cold trap. Our temperature pressure profile in our atmosphere is such that when water wants to evaporate, it eventually condenses out and comes back down. So I would argue that it's not life, but it's very specialized planetary conditions that enable water to stay liquid on a planet. So physics is what keeps liquid so. water on the planet rather than physics, life. Yes. Mm -hmm. is that would be my view. But that's the view from the astrophysicist, and you just gave the view from the biologist. So well, she, that's one view from biology. She's view, a little yeah. bit of a heretic when it comes to But you know, one thing is that I'd say the opposite, really, that water is not maybe necessary for life but not sufficient. We're not sure, really, if any kind of life can survive in extremely acidic water or very basic water. Mm -hmm. We don't know all the surrounding factors really, truly required for life. All right, so the answer to the question, are we alone, is... We don't know, but we're taking the first steps to find the answer. Okay, and uh, in the question, are we alone, when you ask yourself that, what does we mean for you? Are we alone? It means, is our planet Earth alone? It doesn't mean we humans as intelligent beings. It just means any life form at all. But, so you're, we but you're well aware that most of the public are more interested in we. I know they human, are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But that's not what you're... Well, we're all interested in that. I would love to meet an alien. There's just no question. But I think we have to start somewhere. Okay. And what we do try to, we meaning probably you and I and all the astronomers out there, we try to convince the public that you know, we're taking the first steps. Rocky planets, planets with water, gases that don't belong, that may signify life on the planet. And we kind of will go down those steps and maybe eventually we'll find out what kind of life it is, whether it's intelligent life or just simple single-celled bacteria. Well, I, I wrote an, an article a couple of years ago saying we have not found ET or have we? And the whole idea was that we don't know what life really is, and so we're free, therefore, to say that maybe far from equilibrium dissipative systems are life. And if that's the case, then we've already found hurricanes on Jupiter, for example. So what, what, what do you think of that semantic view of we really don't know what life is, therefore how can we look for it? Or I do. maybe we've already found yeah. it. I, I agree with the thing we don't know what life is. In my view, though, I do take a more conservative approach and that assume that some type of life will use chemistry like we do to extract energy and store energy and release energy to function.
Chemical energy. Chemical energy. Not right. pressure and density energy gradients like I mean, you I have think a hurricane. It may be possible. Maybe possible. But I just think I don't know how we get our heads around it. I mean, I hear the argument that other things might be out there. Sometimes we think maybe life uses mechanical energy, like a windmill. Well, phys <laughs> physicists can easily get their head around. There's a free energy gradient and uh, either density or pressure or concentrations, and therefore any far from equilibrium dissipated structure that extracts that energy, undoes the gradient, you could in some loose sense call life. But you're not going to go there. Well, I'm not not going to go there. Okay. But I'm, <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> but no, let me, let's just take that a little further because we just don't see it on Earth, actually. It's mm -hmm. very terracentric, you know. But did you know there, there is life in, like, ocean currents? They're not extracting the gradient, the mechanical energy gradient. They're actually just waiting for food to flow by mm -hmm. and through them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's definitely an interesting concept. But in that concept, though, the thing I do wonder is how will they store and release energy rather than use it continuously? Right, right. So it's like our car and our engine. Right, it's not right. going to blow so up. How do you store energy? It. Right. Yeah. So, so, so based on those, I mean, I've been led to the idea that uh, maybe the idea of storing energy is much more important than either having a bag or having information, but storage of energy so that you can use that to, I don't know, find some more, I guess. So you're, uh, you're okay with that. Okay. I'm definitely okay now, with that. Now, is the question, are we alone, an important question? It must, you must think it's important because that's what you're dedicating right. some fraction, <laughs> large fraction of your life to. Well, hmm, let me think for a second. You know, this is the, why is what you're doing important? Well, I think everyone has that question. And even I've seen it in children, I've seen it in adults. Often we have a low moment in life, people be like, why am I here? What am I doing here? What's the purpose of life? Mm -hmm. And so I think in our kind of subculture of Earth, that's how we're trying to address that problem. But do chimpanzees ask that question? Do you think dogs ask that question? Are we alone? I don't think my dog is asking that question. No. <laughs> no. Well, my dog just wants to know when is dinner. So, so when do you think when we started go asking that question? You said even babies, but how about let's go back 100,000 yeah, years think. or 200,000 or 300,000. If this question is so important to us now, when did it become important, do you think? Any idea? No Ask idea. a primatologist, right? Yeah, no, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, well, do you have an idea on that one? A little yes. bit, but uh, let's not go there. Does it make you a better person to, to find out about the universe? I'm thinking of... Carl Sagan, he said, you know, humans are the, the universe's way of finding out, being aware of itself. Now, that's kind of a grandiose kind of statement. Do you, what do you think of that? Well, I don't know about that statement, but I do think as humans, we do have a desire to explore, you know, to create art, and all those things that are just so part of being human. And part of that is our curiosity to ask yeah, whether we're Yeah, part of that is our curiosity to ask what's out there. Is anything out there? Is anyone out there? And how did we come to be? Whether that's us as individuals or just our planet or our species. But you're making a distinction, and most scientists do, between is there any life out there and intelligent life. Almost most of the public are more, much more interested in the question of is there any intelligent life that we can talk to, essentially almost like a search for God. But most scientists are saying, wait a minute, hold out. Let's look for life in some kind of more general way. And, and bacteria, yeah, we're, we'll, if we find bacteria, we'll be excited. Most public will probably not. So. You said, you invoked, everybody's interested in the question, but really they're not. They're interested in that more specific question, which you are more mm -hmm. ignoring. You're not a SETI researcher. You're looking for no, biosignatures. That's right. The thing is that we have to take the first steps. It's like all kids, you know, many kids want to be a star soccer player, but a baby has to learn how to walk first. And so I try to explain to people, we're just trying to take those first steps. We hope that others be, you know, if we get really lucky, we'll, we'll get a rival, we'll get contact and we'll get something <laughs> great. And I I'm a big fan, big supporter of SETI and science fiction movies and everything else, but we're just taking the first step here to evaluate how common life might be at all. Okay. And uh, what you have a favorite science fiction movie? Um, I won't say I have a favorite one, but the most recent one I've seen is Arrival. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about Arrival was just the first movie ever that depicted aliens as something we couldn't understand. Mm. Usually aliens are little green humanoids. And the Arrival movie, they were kind of undefined, and their communication system was so very different. Yeah. So I love that concept that we have no idea what life is, as you said, no idea what life would be. Now in the movie Contact, you've seen that with Jodie Foster, at the end, a little kid asked the question, are we alone? And her answer was, a little bit quippish, was, well, if we are, it would be an awful waste of space. Now, a lot of people think that's kind of funny. When I heard that, I was just appalled at the racism and the speciesism of it. Okay, right. What did, what did your reaction? I don't remember that particular. I don't remember that particular line from it. But let me think for a second. That line was repeated three times <laughs> really? in, the, in the movie. Yes. 
Um, once in the middle, his dad, her dad asked that. Remember, she was a kid, right, and she asked, that. and her dad says, "Well, if they are, it's an awful waste of space." And then her Matthew McConaughey lover asked that, and then uh, at the end, the kid asked her, and she replied what she had heard from Matthew and from her dad. And that is, what did she say? She said, "Well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space." Oh, I see. Right. I don't know. I think there's a lot of space out there, and. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't think it would be a waste of space? Not, I mean, no. I mean, it's like saying, well, the forest is a waste of space, or this river outside. Like, why is it there? All right. All right. So, so you, so you're not into speciesism very much, but you are into biosignatures. Could how is your research into biosignatures helping to answer the question, are we alone? Well, one of the things we're faced with is assuming that life, some life, uses chemistry to extract and store and use energy, and making byproducts. We think these byproduct gases could indicate signs of life on another planet. And that's kind of the whole premise of biosignature gases as a search for life. Now you use the word byproduct, and that's a little bit fraught word for me because mm -hmm. aren't your eyeballs a byproduct of life in the sense that they mutate, there's a byproduct, and then all the, it gets selected and then it stays around? Well, I don't know because eyes actually have a useful function. If we think about... But doesn't the oxygen have a useful function in our atmosphere to allow um, us to breathe? It allows us to breathe, yes. Yes. So then it is. So, a well, but for us humans, for example, we're breathing in oxygen, we're breathing out carbon dioxide, but we're not breathing out carbon dioxide as any purpose other than to just eliminate waste. Are you sure the plants might appreciate oh, it quite a bit? Oh, the plants appreciate it, yeah. <laughs> well, we, that's right. And actually, what you've hit upon now is why it's so complicated and hard and maybe extremely challenging to identify any gas as a possible biosignature because we live in an ecosystem. And now the whole field has moved not towards this gas, that gas, or the other gas, but actually a gas in context. What is going to let us know if this gas actually is produced in abundant quantities and it's not being used up by some other species? Well, I had a student who said, there are hydrocarbons on Titan? Boy, that's probably dangerous. Don't light a match. And I said, well, wait a minute. To have a match to, to burn, you need a redox potential. And you just have the hydrocarbons, you don't have the electron acceptor. So, doesn't it, isn't it the case that biosignature gases come in pairs because of that? Um, I'd say yes and no. I mean, there are these life that extracts energy from chemical energy gradient that uses redox reactions. And in that case, yes, you would expect to see components. But it turns out that life on Earth produces thousands of gases, and some of them are not from extracting energy from the environment. We have a few concrete examples. One is DMS, dimethyl sulfide, made by phytoplankton on the Earth's oceans. Mm -hmm. And those ones aren't. They're more complicated molecules produced as like, as from a secondary process. Okay, so and if we see any of those, although on Earth they're produced in very small quantities, not necessarily. So DMS is something that James Lovelock had to look at very carefully, and he wanted to embed that in the concept of the, the Earth, the biosphere, being alive and then self-regulating, so in some sense a life form. Uh, what do you think of that idea? I like that idea. <laughs> on exoplanets, it's going to be a challenge to detect anything at all, actually. So we won't get to really appreciate that for other worlds. All right. And is there a way to look for? I mean, he was looking for chemical disequilibrium. Now, I know you've written a paper about chemical disequilibrium, mm -hmm. and Catling's group has written another one, and they talked about, I think, thermodynamic equilibrium, and you guys were talking about kinetic equilibrium. In other words, there are, if, if you just do a delta G where you just go, Forget mm -hmm. about the threshold energies. I'm just going to talk about from here to here. And you guys, I think, were right. talking about, wait a minute, you could go from here to here and here to here, not necessarily the lowest right. delta G. Can you talk about the, is there a distinction worthy of being, making, being made between those two approaches? Um, uh, I was told that your kinetic approach is much harder because then you need to know the context and all the other sub-steps that you right, would right. go to. But he was like, oh, the bottom is here, the top is here, then let's... I see what you're saying. Um, I don't know if I can address that in a way that would be satisfying. I think... As an astronomer now, I think it's going to be incredibly complicated to detect chemical disequilibrium at all. Because you'll have to of see... Of either kind? Of any kind. Uh -huh. So I do personally now favor the idea of looking for one gas that's just there in huge abundance. And not necessarily being a definitive biosignature, but enough to motivate more work. All right. Now, yeah. you've talked about uh, TESS, and you talked about follow-up with John, the James Webb Space Telescope. And that would be the best chance we have of identifying these biosignatures well, in Earth-like planets? In the, um, yeah, more, not quite, but more or less. So in the near future, when we think about ourselves as scientists and the public and everyone who wants to find signs of life, the James Webb is indeed our very best chance in the very near future because we're going to study atmospheres of rocky worlds and look for gases like water. We have a shot at seeing oxygen and some other gases, so definitely. But as you know, the James Webb 
we'll be looking at small planets transiting small stars. These red dwarf stars that are very different from our sun and the planets could have environments completely foreign to us. And those aren't necessarily the ones that are going to be found by TESS. Um, well, TESS is also going to be searching for planets orbiting M dwarf stars. But uh, there, how many M dwarfs are above the, the magnitude limit of? of uh, thousands. Thousands. I mean, it used to be 30,000. It's probably less. Uh -huh. We're all interested in the very brightest M dwarf stars, right. whether yeah. it's TESS or rate of velocity. I'd say 1,000 great ones, probably 300 prime ones, prime yeah. time tar targets well, that are bright. Proxima Centauri is not one of them. Well, Proxima would be one of them if it had a transiting planet. So right. it's definitely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it's bright enough. Even though we can't see it with our eyes, it's uh, bright enough for TESS. Yes, in fact, TESS is red sensitive. I see. And yes, it is. It's above the blurring effects of Earth's atmosphere, so it can do precise measurements on what to us would okay. be fainter stars. So if you're able to find an Earth-like planet, it will be Earth. orbiting an M dwarf, yeah, and it will be identified right. by TESS as a transit, and then it will be looked to follow up with... That's the plan. I see. Mm -hmm. I but see. It, none of this is as easy as it sounds. <laughs> uh, I think we have finding planets by the transit technique down to a formula now. Okay. But looking at the atmospheres, you know, we have to see... We have to see repeated transits in order to get enough signal. Yes. Scheduling will be a nightmare. And it's not, it's not going to be easy, but yeah. Okay. And uh, do you think, let's say you don't find anything. Uh, what's the next step after this? Well, whether or not we find anything on the M stars, our next step will be, I believe, the large ground-based telescopes now under construction. We have the extremely large telescope. Giant Magellan Telescope, 30 meter telescope. They'll be more sensitive since they're bigger light buckets and they have adaptive well, optics. Yes, but they'll be, be looking at a different category, actually. They're going to do direct imaging. They're going to block uh -huh. out the star and look at the planet light directly for a certain special subset of stars. And these are, again, M dwarf stars, the brightest, actually, not the brightest, they have a special sweet spot. So if the very coldest M dwarf stars, the planet is too close to the star, they can't spatially separate those on the sky. And the very brightest ones, the planet in the habitable zone would be too far away. But there's some sweet spot in the middle there where they can block out the starlight mm -hmm. and they can reach levels of 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 contrast. And they have a hope of doing direct imaging. They have a sample of a dozen to 100 M dwarf stars, including Proxima Centauri. With spectroscopy? With spectroscopy. I mm -hmm. see. But Is they'll have to do it from gr the ground. High enough resolution to look at these mm -hmm. gases? And yes, yeah, so they have several ideas they're working through. And you know you do follow the giant... Um, in your class or however you're going to embed it, you know, we do study atmospheres already and we do direct imaging. Yes. We have some very beautiful examples mm -hmm. of the widely separated giant planets. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're very high, spe well, let's call it relative to other astronomy fields, quite high spectral resolution and very nice signal yeah. noise. Now, Yuri Milner gave $100 million to help improve uh -huh. the sensitivity of the SETI searches. You think that was a good idea? Yes, I do. And if I gave you $100 billion, uh -huh. uh, with the caveat, you have to spend this money to try help answer the question, are we alone? How would you spend it? Well, I, would, I definitely know how I would spend that. I would spend it searching for planets orbiting sun-like stars to search for the true Earth twin, where we have some grounding and understanding of, planetary, of planetary science and of sun-like environments. Particularly, I would build the starshade, a giant specially shaped screen that would block out the starlight so we can see the planet directly. And the reason it would cost so much probably billions of dollars. I'll give you 100 billion. I'll give me 100 billion so I could build several star shades and a big enough telescope to collect enough light from the planet to do relatively high spatial resolution spectroscopy. I mean high spectral resolution spectroscopy. So you build several star shades with mm -hmm. enough to see, at, let's say, at one AU, an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star, yes. and then mm -hmm. uh, with enough photons to do the spectroscopy to right. see the gases. Yeah, and we would look for water vapor, and we'd look for oxygen. The ozone cutoff is spectacular. We'd look for that. Would it be in the infrared, or would you be infrared and visible? Or? We'd probably do a triaged approach, given all that money. <laughs> we'd look for visible wavelength first to find the planet, and mm -hmm. then we would look for water and oxygen. And if all that was successful in a nice, beautiful spectrum, we could conceive of looking into the near-infrared with a more complicated system. So none of this money you would spend on buying uh, microscopes to look for nano-aliens? No. And... You've seen the movie Men in Black. Mm, I don't think so. Anyway, in this movie, we're inside of aliens, essentially. Okay. And so, so these are, those are weird ideas that I've heard about. Nano, maybe there are nano aliens in this room, and we just don't know about it because we haven't looked carefully at the unknown things at, at the very smallest scales. Um, so you wouldn't do that. Do you think that's a stupid, crazy idea? Well, I, do, I wouldn't do it myself. But I love that idea of the shadow biosphere. There's leftover life on Earth. 
that perhaps took a different path in chemical space mm. or DNA space. I love the concept of science fiction, that there are aliens among us. I just don't think it's feasible. I personally wouldn't spend my money on it. Maybe you can get Greg Fournier downstairs to do a little bit. <laughs> <Maybe. laughs> okay. Um, now, how about viruses? Are you think viruses are alive, or you don't care, or it doesn't matter? Um, it doesn't matter that much to me. Okay. Do you? Well, if the origin of life is comes from an RNA world, it's kind of like a viral world, mm -hmm. and maybe uh, I've I've said in the past that uh, if you're looking for alien life, you should probably look at the origin of life here, and probably things diverge from there into unexpected things. Right. That means the best prediction we can make about life elsewhere would be based on the the base of the tree of life here which might be RNA life, which would be viral life, essentially. So that's why I think hey, maybe there's ton a lot of people say, oh, there's bacteria everywhere, but who knows about humans? If you take that one step further, you say, well, maybe there are viral RNA worlds out there, but who knows about you know, cellular life? So that's the, that's the argument. Right. No, I like that argument. I'm very fixated on a narrow-minded search using conventional astronomy tools. Well, the RNA world had to do some type of metabolism, so it, too, probably produced some type of biosignature gases. <laughs> Well, what do you think that would be? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I do not know. Now, Arthur C. Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced civilization will be indistinguishable from magic. And then a guy, German guy said, oh, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced uh, civilization will be indistinguishable from nature. Hmm. And uh, so the idea is if you're really advanced, right. you become ecologically sustainable. And if you, you don't go cutting down trees and building parking lots. Do you, uh, any comment on that? Well, I love the concept of post-biological intelligence that we see even now in such a short time since our Industrial Revolution. We're unfortunately glued to our phones. You know, we have really simple, though, um, fake body parts, like people have pacemakers are exceptionally common. I just see, I do really believe that. It's just a belief. I don't have any proof or evidence. The fact that artificial intelligence now has reached a level where for some problems, self-driving cars that learn by watching human behavior, not by any algorithms, by seeing that computers can have their own intuition essentially just from looking at data that will we've labeled for them I do see this possibility actually of that and so I go with the first one not different from magic in that if I were I mean I think our life here on earth might be very short not for the reasons of nuclear destruction or global warming on our earth getting destroyed I really do think we're going to evolve into something else entirely and that's really probably the most abundant type of life form out there well most Physicists believe that because they, that I think, I mean, I kind of tease physicists because they think, oh, our brains are really good and smart, better to be smarter. Therefore, if you have life, you're going to have a technological life. If you have technological life, then you evolve into computers. But that argument, Martin Rees and Paul Davies have said, well, if that's the case, why in the world are you looking for biological life on the surface of a planet? You should be looking for these, these far more mm -hmm. abundant uh, computer, alien, whatever it is, contraptions that you, we will build in a thousand years or a hundred years or a well, billion years. Or, or, and so why are you looking on the surfaces of for biological life rather than looking for, I don't know, flying aliens. Uh, That's such a great question. I mean, we should find a way to find these other things as well, but I can tell you for sure that we know from our own planet, and again, a very terracentric view, that biology, bacteria, have completely re-engineered our atmosphere. They've made a signal that we can see with conventional astronomical tools. When I think about these perhaps post-biological intelligence living on a planet, and we probably can't see them. Why would they live on a planet? They'd live in outer space. They could live they anywhere, but yeah. if they, unless they have like a giant spectroscopic signature, uh -huh. we just have no way to find them right now. Uh -huh. But I, I, I do think it's right. It would be the, a great way to search for life. But we're just kind of going on this concept. You know, I really hope we're not all proven completely wrong a thousand years from now, but we're going on this concept that bacteria is going to be more common than highly intelligent life. It's a more likely first step. Mm. You know, our own Earth, we think, exactly. for yeah. billions of years, we didn't have oxygen. Yeah. And so that that's our best chance right now to find signs of life in our very nearby stellar neighborhood. Right. I, I agree with you, but for a different reason. I don't okay. su subscribe to the idea that uh, human-like intelligence is a convergent feature of evolution. We should expect to see intelligent aliens out there. And if you don't see that, then it is a makes sense to look for a bacteria or an RNA world on the surface of planets. Uh, and if... If life evolved into technological life, then we have a big problem with the Fermi paradox, right? So what's your favorite solution to the Fermi paradox? Um, my favorite solution is that they either just didn't want to come here or it's just too far. Didn't want to and too far? Yeah, didn't want to and or too far. Well, if you're a laptop, you can wait an awful long time. <laughs> okay, it's true. <laughs> I love the theory that they didn't want to, and I just love this concept of when you see ants. I'm sure you have ants. I have ants. I have right now these carpenter ants in my house. They're bad news because they eat wood. 
but I just love them. It's like if you want to talk to an ant, mm -hmm. you want to have a conversation with them and just engage. How how would you do that? I mean, besides from killing them or disrupting their like path. You do it with the pheromones. That the, I mean, Feynman did this, right? Did, but he, you know, that's not like. I think the aliens, whoever they are, wherever they are, if they're so advanced, why would they want it? It would be like going somewhere just to kind of engage with ants. Mm -hmm. And aside from giving them like a one-time signal of pheromones or whatever mm -hmm. you're going to do, like what's the point? Well, That's how I see it. The, well, the point is not that they would talk to the ants, but that the ants would find out that there's something other to talk to, right? Because we're the ants, right? And we're trying to find out right, if there are the humans ants. out there. Do these humans know more about the universe than we do? Uh, okay, that's a kind of like a SETI debate. How about the idea of... Uh, Stephen Jay Gould talked about uh, replaying the tape of life, going back and then replaying it again, and then asking the question, would you find that something similar to human beings? Now, Simon Conway Moore says, of course you'll find human beings. It's such a great convergent thing. And then Simon, uh, uh, Gould says, are you crazy? No, it's so contingent. So there's a debate in mm -hmm. astrobiology between these two communities. And one of the ways that biologists are trying to help astrobiologists is to say, okay, what is it on, in biology and life that evolved multiple times independently right and then based on that those become the candidates for mm -hmm. what we should expect elsewhere what do you think of that logic I love that I'm not you're asking me questions that are way outside of what I actually work on so you may as well ask you know what I'm saying like I can't really weigh in on these in any authoritative fashion but I do like it and the only argument that has ever resonated with me was that we did have five continents and we saw five separate things evolve and we didn't get intelligent life on each continent and the example highlighted was Australia how marsupials of all kinds um, evolved and had similar functions to those types of animals that had evolved in North America. Mm -hmm. And they didn't see anything happening anytime soon. And uh, I just remember some really funny things like how dumb. I've never been to Australia, but the koalas apparently are pretty dumb. Is that true? They're so cute. Uh, well, they seem dumb to human okay, beings, right. but I'm sure that there are smart koalas and dumb koalas and the smartest ones. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure. I'm writing an article about that. So, okay, right. so I'll, <laughs> I'll well, send, 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 send it right. to you. I'll send it to you. The thought was that if every ecological niche is filled now, mm. you know, there's no need for intelligent life to arise. They sort of captured the full parameter space. And so that has resonated with me as a, a non-evolutionary biologist. Okay. We had five continents, five chances, and we saw perhaps one in five. So let me ask you, the, 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 your favorite solution to the Fermi Paradox was they do not want to come here or they just look at us and look down their nose and say, who wants to talk to ants? Those are your... The, well, the one was that, those, that was one argument, that they see that we're here and they just don't, who wants to talk to ants? The I second see. one is that it really is genuinely too far, that life is rare. And I know the Fermi Paradox doesn't follow this argument. They say, look, it doesn't matter how far it is. They'll go to the near place first, then another near place, and they'll branch out from there. Mm -hmm. But it takes a lot of energy to travel when you right. think about that, a lot of energy... And it may just be that we never got over that energy barrier because of the vast distances and perhaps the rarity of intelligent life. Okay. How about, the, I was reading a, an article that you wrote about the Seeger equation, which is a modification, kind of like a selection effect uh, associated, kind of like the Drake like the equation. Drake equa like, like the Drake yeah, equation, but the, more Drake of a sele more selection observer oriented. And one term was like the observability of these things. And one thing in the Drake equation, they have the rate of star formation and the lifetime of civilization. And I was looking for that, those two terms in yeah, your no, equation. Yeah, I skipped that. You skipped, but that must be embedded into the observability because the mm. lifetime, if you're looking for a biosignature, just because you have life, hey, maybe the life goes away. And then just like a civilization go away, right. there's a lifetime of civilization, there's a lifetime of biosignature production. So that would be in the F sub yeah, O I, term, right? Um, I think I put that in another term. But it's like the chance that there's life and the chance that life is spectroscopically detectable. All right. For, but for how yeah. long? It didn't have a specified time period, assuming right. the lifetime of the planet. I see. So you assume that mm -hmm. once life gets going, it stays there. Well, you can make your own choice on that one. Okay. I try to put all the speculative terms in one place. So, you know, for example, for you could say, let's say all planets have life that emerges and it only lasts for a fraction of the time. Yeah. You could assign 50%. That doesn't mean 50% of planets will have a spectroscopic signature just averaged mm -hmm. over lifetime okay. and planets. It is 50%. Okay. Back a while ago, you said, oh, I would love to find aliens. Now, let me talk to the emotional side of, of Sarah Seeger. Close your eyes and involve, okay. what type of aliens would you like to find or would you love to find? Oh, I don't know. This is a tough question. I wasn't anticipating this. Actually, honestly, I've never thought of that. <laughs> well, I'm not asking you to think. I'm asking you to feel. I know. I don't. Um. <laughs> okay, so let me think. No, feel. I, I, I don't think I can do that, actually. Close your eyes. It helps you close your eyes. Close your eyes. <laughs> well, for example, about ten minutes ago, you said, oh, I would love to find an alien, blah, 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 and then you said something. And you could... And well, I'd like to know... 
I like to find an alien who had the answers. I know that's not emotional, but you know, what's out there? Like, what is out there beyond our little mini sphere and the things we can see? Just have an alien who can communicate all that to us, however. So you're looking for an omniscient God? Well, I don't know if it's a God in the terms of when we think of God as like creating and influencing, but yeah, just someone who knows what's out there. But I, I gotta think of that one a little more. I'm not a very like emotional feely person, you mm -hmm. know? <laughs> so few of us scientists are. Right? <laughs> I know. That's why sometimes people come here and want to interview me and they like want to smile or they want something. It's like, that's just not... Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> like, what do you think of the, the public or students' biggest misconceptions about astrobiology and the question, are we alone? I think what students don't appreciate initially is that we have no idea. We have so many unanswered questions. I think students come in thinking, here's the textbook, here's the answer, here's the question, here's the answer, here's the homework, which has already been answered by tons of students in the past. And the sort of the beauty of exploration, you know, the joy of discovery, the fact that most things we don't know, actually, I think that's what I'd want to communicate to them. And their misconception is that we, they think we know it all already. Yeah, their misconception is they think we, meaning their professor, knows it all and that science already figured it all out and they're just here to learn what we've what, we're, what we've already figured out and we're going to teach them. So the misconception is that, especially in astrobiology, there's mostly unknowns. Yeah. Well, as an example of that, I'm, I'm doing Airbnb here in Boston, and the person who I'm staying with thinks that we've already found life elsewhere. Do you run into that? Oh, a lot. <laughs> I was selling my, I was trying to get rid of a bunch of stuff, so I, what was I selling? A dresser. And the people who came over, like, I wasn't going to tell them what I worked on because I just try to keep it short, but my husband, who's an amateur astronomer, he had this big telescope and mount in our like foyer, and they started asking me questions about it, and I just said, somehow we got onto the fact that I'm a professional, professional astronomer, and they're like, oh yeah, I just heard about this life detected the other day. And it wasn't <laughs> that, it was about another Earth-like planet, which was of course already exaggerated, and somehow it got confused in their mind. Yeah. And all the time, quite often, actually. So that's one of the biggest problems we oh, have to deal with. We have not yet found right, that. It's not just that, but then there's the other group of people who are certain UFOs are here, mm. And even, for example, after, I think it was LHS 1140B was discovered, I had this very sweet voice from a lady with a foreign accent on my voicemail. And she was, she's visited this planet already. She wants to tell me about mm. her experience and what had happened. And it didn't have the sense of urgency and panic most mm -hmm. random phone calls have, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you get as well. Mm -hmm. But I just like amazing how a lot of people in their mind, like perhaps this is just in the old days people believed in angels, but they, they now do believe in aliens in a real, very real sense. So have you been abducted by aliens? I have not actually, but I've met people who have, supposedly, yeah. Okay, and, <laughs> we're, and presumably you're not interviewing them and trying to find out more because you don't believe them. That's right, but a professor here, believe it or not, did take some time, I think it was in the 1980s or 90s, and he and John Mack from Harvard, who's since deceased, took this really seriously. And they actually interviewed people who've been abducted. abducted. Mm -hmm. And they produced a really nice volume, actually, on it. I have it at home. And his thought was, this professor here, he's trained two Nobel laureates, actually. So he had this thought that he communicated to me that, why wouldn't you try to find out? Mm -hmm. Because it could be something amazing, truly. Like, why would you just overlook something and not mm -hmm. give it a shot? Mm -hmm. Well, he gave it a shot, and then he dropped it because he couldn't find an answer. And the most remarkable thing after all of this was how identical the stories were, almost identical the stories were by people who had never met each other. Mm -hmm. And so that actually is, this is going to sound crazily pseudoscientific, but it remains a mystery, basically. But you're not investigating this. I'm not investigating it. I don't think they were abducted. I think it's another weird thing about our culture. I see. So but the people I've met who have supposedly been abducted are the nicest, in many ways, most reasonable pe people you could meet. Generous, kind. They're just so certain that they've been abducted. And you've never seen a UFO? No, I've never seen a UFO. I have no belief in UFOs, no belief that, that aliens have ever visited. But you see all kinds of unidentified flying objects. Like yeah, I don't see that many, but if I do see one, I will put it in the category of something I just don't know what it is, right. rather than automatically assume it's a UFO. But you, you, I'm sure you know how many people believe in UFOs of all walks of life. Okay, but you don't. You no, don't. I don't believe okay, at all. Okay, so we you? haven't... The, Do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe in unidentified flying objects everywhere. For example, I see a plane and say, I don't know what uh, airline that is, so therefore it's an unidentified flying object. True. But, uh, but you do know it's a plane, though. And you, if, you, <laughs> if you spent long enough here in Boston, believe it or not, I'm just going to run this by you, you would know what it was if it's oh, a really yeah. big plane. Yeah. Because we only have, um, not like in some large airports where many flights a day are going to Frankfurt, right. we'd right. only have one. So if you'll see the one plane going to Ireland. Yes. 
at the right time, the same time every day. And uh -huh. so actually you would know, uh, oddly enough. Well, I have higher <laughs> thresholds for when you say identified, you know, you can be identified at what level. You know, it's a plane, what airline it is, you know, who's driving, you know, blah, blah, blah. You go on forever. Anyway, um, so do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? My advice would be, for students, would be to try to get involved in research early on. Try to find a summer project or a term project, just so you can get exposed to research and see what it's all about. And see how you know learning from a textbook and a lecture is very different from trying to learn on your own and trying to explore unanswered questions. And so that's part of what you said. The, the biggest misconception was they so that students thought that the answers were already right. there. Right. But not everyone wants to do research. Some people are taking a class just to learn some science mm -hmm. or get their science credit out of the way. And I think it's fine. I'd like them to clear up their misconception without having to do research. Those that want to pursue it, it would be a great opportunity to do it. The other advice for students wanting to pursue astrobiology is. If you really want to do this, like at the graduate level, choose a discipline to focus on. We've started to see too many people be too broad without being deep at all. And it's very hard to master a topic and contribute meaningfully to research without having a specialized discipline you know, within the umbrella of astrobiology. Okay. And now you talked about TESS and the James Webb Space Telescope. And then you said the next generation would be humongous ground-based telescopes. And that, I guess, on the time scale of 20 to 50 years. Well, maybe sooner, right? Because they're being built now. They've well, I'm not, interested in 100 yeah. to 1,000 oh, to 10,000. We haven't 000. talked about the starshade yet. Oh, no, we did talk about starshade. A little right. bit, but I'm so interested in much further into the future, right. like your grandchildren. What, yeah. if, they, if they're interested in the question you're interested in, what do you think they'll be doing? Well, I think we don't know yet. And I think that what we're starting to see here in engineering is we're reaching our limits. I mean, we're going to build a 30-meter telescope. We might be able to build a 100-meter telescope on the ground. How about, but, a, how about a moon, far side moon? Well, let's finish with Earth, though. But I think beyond that, we're going to have to do something completely different. We can build things and stow them in rockets and launch them and deploy them. But honestly, beyond that, they're going to have to build in space or fabricate in space, send up raw materials and print out parts. Mm -hmm. Now, the far side of the moon, you know, that's, I think, a bit of an, um, a misconception. It's got a lot of dust. People hate dust. You know, all that stuff on the ground, the mm -hmm. regolith. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're gaining anything from by going on the dark side of the moon. You have to land and assemble. I think space is where it's at. Really? Huh. Think about this for a second. There's this one company, I think it's even called Spider, and they're literally trying to be a spider in space mm -hmm. and to generate, you know, take up raw things and generate material and build large structures. So I think whatever they're going to do in the future, I don't think we know yet. I see. How about the interferometry? Uh, uh, you need to keep care of your distances very, very accurately to like some fraction of a wavelength. And uh, is any progress being made on those? Well, here in the U.S., we've more or less stopped at least interferometry in space because we've decided to pursue other paths. But I think we are. I think people are making progress in that. When you think of, you know, LISA in space and other things, I think people are going to figure out how to do that. Okay, and particularly for gravitational wave detection. If gravitational not right wave the detection, end. yeah. Well, there's a difference between sensing and control. I think in LISA, they have to sense where they're at oh. and some looser control. Oh. But for inter interferometry, you really have to be positioned. Oh, so it's a much harder thing. Much harder. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. And uh, are we alone? <laughs> I hope we're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, you said, wait a minute, you said you didn't have emotion. This is a hope. This I is know, emotion. I I'm trying to, like, you know, warm up you, a little here. So. <laughs> <laughs> you said, you, why do you hope we're not alone? Um, not because it would be an awful waste of space. It's just like a lot of people on an emotional level, I just, I just hope there's more out there than just our kind of mundane, tedious, everyday lives. I just like to think in the universe, you know, there's so many stars out there and billions of galaxies, that there's more to it than just hydrogen and helium.